Uh, can you, again, just anybody tell me what God is like in a few words? What's God like? God never changes. Oh, amen. Anything else? Never lies. Very good. Knows everything. Everything, Seth, though? Everything, really? Okay. Yeah, he's right. He's everywhere. That's right. Anything else? All knowing. What else? Anybody? Holy. Holy, wise. Yeah. Somebody said something over here. All powerful. That's important, isn't it? Anybody? He's big. He's great. Awesome. Love. Our only hope. Strong. Good. You guys are doing good. Good. All right. Well, today, as you can see in your sheet there, we're going to talk about the wisdom of God, that God is all wise. And I think it's so important because if God was not wise, we would be left with a God who has all power, but would misuse it. <laughs> and so I, I'm so thankful that God is all wise. Um, he's infinitely wise. Everything he's done, or everything he does, he does in wisdom. Everything. And all of God's choices are perfect choices. Do you know that? All of God's choices are perfect choices. A.W. Tozer says this in his book on uh, the attributes, as it were, of God. Uh, um, he talks about this. He says, God's acts are done in perfect wisdom. First of all, for his own glory. And then, for the highest good of the greatest number, for the longest time. <laughs> and he goes on, not only could, he, uh, could his acts not be done better, a better way to do them could not be imagined. An infinitely wise God must work in a manner not to be improved upon by finite creatures. <laughs> I like it, it just puts us, I guess, in our place that... Uh, we may think we're so wise, but he's wiser. All his thoughts. We can't improve upon God. Really? Can we? Can any of us improve upon God and tell him a better way to do it? Maybe we do it in prayer. But we really understand that God is all wise. And so as you follow along in your notes there, Job, Job said this about God in Job 9.4. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against him and succeeded? Hmm. He is wise in heart, though. God is wise in heart, and we better know that, too. Job also in verse 12 says, uh, chapter 12 and verse 13, With God are wisdom and might. He has counsel and understanding. With him are wisdom and might. And there again, I put the two together. By wisdom, he knows what he's, what's the best thing to do, the best plan. And with might, or with wisdom, in case I read that wrong, by wisdom, he knows what his best thing to do, his best plan. And with might, he can bring it to pass, right? He has the power to bring it to pass. If God was wise without, uh, without being all-powerful, it would just be a good idea. But he wouldn't be able to bring it to pass. On the other hand, if he had all power, and we've already said this, but without wisdom, he would misuse his power. But with him are wisdom and might. And when it, uh, in Isaiah, he talks about the Messiah to come. He prophesies and he says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom. Spirit of wisdom. See, everything Jesus did as he walked the face of this earth, Everything he did was done in perfect wisdom. You can't find with one fault with anything Jesus said, not even one word that he ever spoke when he walked the face of this earth. It's all true. There's not a word that he spoke that wasn't spoken in wisdom. He, knowing their minds, said this. <laughs> uh, he just, he, in him is a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. 
Colossians chapter 2 and verse 3, speaking of Christ, it says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I think that song that we just sang is appropriate. Christ is enough. In him is everything I need. I don't know if you believe that or not, but I'm, the older I get, the more I fight it. That is so true. That is so true. In him, it is in Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul, again, in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, we've looked at that many times here. He says, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways, or his ways past finding out. Oh, the depth of the wisdom of God. God is wise. And the more you think about it, and that's why I think meditation is such a good thing, meditating on the Word of God, letting the Word of God dwell in you richly. It's so beneficial. Uh, you realize the depth of, of the wisdom of God in this. And then he, as he brings the... Uh, the book of Romans to a close, Paul just explained God's wisdom in, in salvation and how we come to Christ. And he gets to the end of the book and he just says simply in Romans 16, 27, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ, amen. <laughs> to the only wise God. Who could come up of, of a plan of salvation like that? And we'll look at that in a, a moment briefly in a little while later uh, here. So wisdom, uh, wisdom in people, uh, there's wise people in the face of the earth. Wasn't Solomon the wisest man that ever lived because God had given him this wisdom and stuff. But uh, wisdom in people can be frustrated by circumstances outside of our control. Wouldn't you agree? I think parents understand that. We can tell our kids that we plan to do certain things, uh, maybe go on a picnic someday or, or to a special event. And then weather comes and, and either it's canceled or we just can't make it because of that or, or a sickness comes or there's so many things outside of our control that uh, even if we, uh, as people are wise and give good counsel, uh, circumstances and so on outside of our control can change things quite a bit. Do you ever think of Ahithophel? Remember when David, King David is, is leaving Jerusalem with all the people with him. Uh, Absalom, his son, had kind of tricked the people and was uh, uh, hijacking, I guess, the office of king. And so Absalom is coming back. Ahithophel was David's counselor, a wise man. He gave good counsel. And uh, so as David's leaving with another counselor too, he said, hey, why don't you go back into the city and confuse because Ahithophel is with, with Absalom, my son, and he's, he's a good counselor. He's smart. I want you to go, whatever he says, say the opposite, basically. That's how the story goes. Just whatever he says, say something different so that they don't listen to him. David knew he was a smart man. And so Absalom comes into the city and Hithophel, Hithophel, what do you say we do with this situation now? Do we go ahead and attack David now? He said, you better, you bet your boots, go get him now. He's tired, the people are with him. It was wise counsel. Verse 14 of 1 Samuel 17 says it was good counsel. Good counsel, he called it. God, the word of God called it good counsel. Well, now, I forget the other name. Was it Hushai? Whatever his name, the other counselor, says the opposite. No, don't you know? You just It's like a, a lion robbed, her, robbed of her cubs. She's, he's angry. Don't, don't mess with them now. Not that now. Anyway, they listened to his, his advice, and Ahithophel felt so down. He used to taking that, uh, uh, people listening to his advice, he goes home and sets his house in order and hangs himself. Uh, but uh, what I want to say with that is, is that man's counsel can be uh, not taken. It was good counsel, but it wasn't taken. It was, it was outside of his control, too, to, to control the events. And so in the same way, no matter how wise we are as, as individuals, our wisdom falls, can I just say, so short of God's and uh, uh, how much we need the wisdom of God in all things. So Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, I think it is a good explanation for our thoughts versus God's. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. Let's get that straight right off the bat, huh? <laughs> in the Christian walk. 
that our ways are not like his. Declares the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And I'm so glad of that, because then in the midst of my confusion, I can look to somebody who has the answer, somebody who's all wise for help. And so, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. All right, God's wisdom, God not only has all wisdom, God's wisdom is displayed in creation. I mean, all you have to do is take a look at this world and see the wisdom of God. Even the heavens declare the glory of God. And it's talking about all of creation. Uh, but God gave, was wise when he structured everything in the universe and gave it stability. Uh, Proverbs 3.19 says, The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. Psalm 104, verse 24. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. You, you can just take one insect, one tree, one, one thing in the universe and start to study a little bit and you just find God out the, the wisdom of God in, in one little area of his creation. All his works, it says, are all, for all, uh, in wisdom you have made them all. Genesis one thirty one. after God had made everything, uh, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was what? Very good. Very good. And so in wisdom, he made it, and he made it good. The creator, also God, distinguishes himself from the false gods uh, in this way. Listen to this, Jeremiah 10, 11, and 12. Thus says... Uh, Thus shall you say to them, The gods who did not make the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. It is he, in the speaking of God, who made the earth, and, uh, who made uh, the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. And that's how he makes it distinguish. <laughs> Your gods that have eyes but don't see. Your gods who have mouths but don't speak. He said, your gods didn't make the heavens and the earth and they'll perish just like everything else that's temporal. He says, but I, I made the heavens by wisdom, or the earth by wisdom and established it in, with his counsel and so on. Established the world by his wisdom and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. So God wisely puts the sun in the, in the right place. God wisely did it 93,000 miles away, right? <laughs> Any closer, and we'd fry. Any farther, and we'd freeze. And even the balance of it. I mean, you think of this world, and you look at it with the valleys, the high mountain peaks, and the, the, the oceans, and the depths that are there, and yet somehow it's all balanced. I mean, I thought of that for the first time really this week. You ever take a ball that's lopsided? And uh, I don't know, I'm sure uh, uh, Ill's there. Uh, if you've ever taken a ball, the, the balls have got to be pretty round, don't they, and balanced for you to spin them on your fingers and, and stuff. Yeah, but does it work very well with a, a ball that's lopsided or something? It's almost impossible, isn't it? And I, I thought of that with the world, with how God made the world. It spins and it doesn't wobble like that, you know. You ever have a bad tire? And boom, 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 boom. <laughs> That's kind of what I picture this world doing like that and just wobbly and things. But he, he so structures it that it's perfect in perfect balance as it spins. He made it all in wisdom. Um, he wisely designed the way the weather works. Isn't that amazing? Uh, the rivers continue to flow into the oceans, right? And yet the ocean's never full, as it were. And then he, through the process of evaporation, what? The clouds start. They move over land again, over the mountains. Pour out water. That runs down back the river again and back into the ocean. 
And in his wisdom, he did that all. And it, to me, it's amazing how many, I think I got this mostly from Hans Kaiser. It's amazing the amount of tons of, of weight in those clouds, the amount of moisture in some of those clouds. Imagine what would happen if God just let it come down in sheets at once. <laughs> oh my goodness. In his wisdom, he, he lets little droplets form and it comes down sometimes very gently to the air, sometimes in a, in a rush, and in a, but never just all at once like a sheet and just wiped out everything. But in his wisdom, isn't that wisdom that created that like that? It's, it's seen everywhere in creation. God is all wise in that the the changing of the seasons that we're experiencing the fall season now and the colors isn't it nice to have those changes move to texas and you got spring and summer spring and summer at least we get fall here <laughs> it's kind of nice but the changing of the weather and and what uh, mark batchelder talked about in sunday school last week seeds how god in his wisdom can transport a seed through birds, through us, in different ways, and, and how that process works. Seeds for, uh, bringing after their kind. and In God's wisdom, all you have to do is anything. So kids, as you're studying in, in science, especially in other classes, look at the wisdom of God as you go through that. Just You have to come away just saying, man, God was wise when he made things the way he did. Get something out of it that gives glory to God, too. And so um, he's wise in it, his wisdom is displayed in by the things that we can see that he'd made. But God is also wise in the, is, in the way he made possible for us to be saved in salvation. In his way, I guess God is wise in the plan of saving sinners. How, how did he do it? You know, a brutal execution of the sinless Son of God to save a wretch like me. It doesn't make sense to the world, to the Greeks, it's foolishness. But God is His infinite wisdom, found a way that we could make it be right with God. And so the verse, and I, we could spend a lot of time here, I'm not going to, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake, and get that into your Underline here, or for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. That's Jesus. He'd never sinned. Perfect son of God. He made him to be sin who knew no sin. So that, why? Why did he have to do it that way? So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So there Jesus bore the penalty for my sins and for your sins on that cross, taking our place. I should have been there. Amazing love that you, my king, should die for me. In the world, it's the opposite way. The subjects of the king, they give their life for the, the king and the kingdom. And in God's kingdom, it's the opposite. The king himself lays down his life so that we might have life and to have, be able to experience the forgiveness of sins. God in wisdom made that plan. That's why at the end of Romans, Paul said, oh, to the only wise God. Nobody could have imagined this way of saving sinners. Only God in his infinite wisdom could do that so that we might become the righteousness of God, have his righteousness that was imputed to us. I didn't deserve it. He, he just imputed it. He credited it to my account, not deserving it. Stunning, yet simple, isn't it? That we sing songs about the cross, the old rugged cross. And we, we, we might put a nice necklace on her, <laughs> wear a nice necklace of a nice, but it was a gru gruesome scene. Um, and I think, but it's still, you hear, oh, I love that old cross. Why? Because what happened there, that makes it such a beautiful story. It was a gory scene, but that's why we have songs about the blood. And I know a lot of churches that have taken anything about the blood out of the songs because they think it's too gory. Mm -hmm. I remember when we were memorizing a verse with some kids uh, in St. Albans once with, um, 
there, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. The mother stopped us and said, you don't, when you, your message is now no longer welcome in my home. We don't want to talk about those things. And yet it's the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. So, and God in his wisdom made the world like that. And also I want to just say that God is wise in his dealings with individuals. God is wise in his dealings with individuals. As we look at maybe a couple uh, people in the Bible, there are many. I, I didn't I know which to choose from. I had so many I wanted to do, and we had to spend, we'd be here another three weeks. I had enough material to go for another month or two on just the wisdom of God. I'm trying to keep this short, but we could have looked at a lot of uh, individuals, but I want you to know right from the bat, when I'm talking about these individuals, I'm also referring to your life. That remember, if God doesn't change, he's just as interested in your life today as he is in these people that we look at in the Bible. So God in his wisdom, he, he deals in wisdom with his people. I think of, I thought of Joseph. Joseph, who as a young boy, <laughs> was uh, sold by his brothers into slavery. We know the story. I'm not going to go into all kinds of details about it. Uh, accused of, of rape later on. Finally got a good job. Things were going good for him. Then the, his master's wife accused him of rape. So he ends up in prison because of it. And uh, he was faithful to the Lord even there. And over time, after prison and so on, he finally got a chance to be in the king's palace again, and they put him over the circumstances into the second in charge of all of Egypt. But for many years, it was not easy for Joseph. Um, he was, uh, but for what purpose did God have in this? What purpose? Uh, God was it God dealing with Joseph in wisdom, or was it things just happening? Joseph was, per, as far as Joseph was personally concerned, the answer is given in Psalm 105, verse 17 to 19, which you have in, I think, in your notes here. He had sent a man, that is, God sent a man of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a, in a collar of iron until what he had said came to pass. In other words, what God said was going to happen until that happened, it says, the word of the Lord tested him. The word of the Lord tested him. And the word of the Lord will test you. Uh, this was what is happening to Joseph when he's sitting in the prison. Uh, the word of the Lord was testing him. God was with him. How many times does it say that in, in Joseph's stories? Uh, Joseph went to prison. The Lord was with him. Now, none of us, like the thought of prison. <laughs> How many of us say, bring it on, you know, put me in prison? Nobody says that by their own choice, welcomes these things. But Joseph was being tested. He was being refined. He was being matured into the man that he became, the man of God that he became. He was being taught as he was uh, a slave and in prison to rely upon God. You know, God can use hardship, doesn't he, sometimes, to teach us things. He did it with Joseph. And Joseph, at the end, could say in Genesis 45, 7 and 8, And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth, to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. I mean, is that hard to say? <laughs> Your brother sold you into slavery. They mistreated you. It talked in Psalm 5. He was in pain. He was delivered with a, an iron yoke around his neck. Painful. And the jeers and the things that he went through, I don't know. But he, he looks at it from heaven's perspective as he looks down on the situation. Now, as it wasn't you who sent me here. It was God who sent me here. It's kind of like Job. We've been going through Job in men's Bible study. It started... What does a Job say? Naked I came into this world after losing everything. Naked I came into this world naked. I'll leave that same way. The Lord gave and the devil took it away. No, that's not what he said, was it? He said the Lord gave and the Lord 
is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You see the, the different attitude there is with that when you realize that God is dealing with you wisely. The attitude you can have in the midst of those circumstances of losing everything is to recognize it as permission from the hand of God. I'm in this situation not of my own choosing, but God has his hand in it. God has his hand in your life. If you're a believer, God has his hand in your life. And if you can learn to look at things from heaven's perspective, you know where we don't get anywhere? Is when, well, nobody knows what I'm going through. I'm the only one suffering like this. Nobody else knows what I'm going through. And we have a pity party. And how far do we get that way? Not far. <laughs> Number one, our attitudes stink. And we don't see God involved in any of it or don't give him or look to him, whatever it might be. But he looks to heaven's perspective. It's not you who sent me here, but God, Joseph said. And these things were written for our learning, aren't they? The same wisdom God used to guide the people in Bible times guides our path today. And so we shouldn't get upset or discouraged when unexpected things happen to us. We shouldn't get discouraged. First Peter 4.12 Peter tells the people, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial, which is, come, uh, which is uh, when it comes upon you, to test you as though some strange thing was happened to you. He said, don't be surprised when you end up getting in trouble or, or something fiery trial comes. Nobody wants these things, but he says, listen, I don't want you to be surprised if a fiery trial comes upon you. Uh, don't, don't look at it as something strange is happening to me. He says, when it does come, to but it's coming to test you. It's coming to test you. What does it test? Anybody know? I heard somebody. Faith. Comes to test our faith. Jesus you, I did that wisely with the disciples. He'd take them through a, 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 the storm, for instance. I'd see. He calms the storm, but he says, why did you doubt? You know, he said, where is your faith? Sometimes he would say, oh, you have little faith. He takes us things to test your faith, your, to test your confidence in God. Is, is God going to be true? And he took Joseph through testing, and he'll take us through testing. So Peter says, don't be surprised at the fiery trial, which is meant to test you. As though, don't think of it as something strange that's happening. God in his wisdom wants to make something out of us. Huh? Just like you want to take a lump of clay and make something out of it. God wants to do the same with your life and with my life. But sometimes it's these hardships that bring it about. Yeah, I wouldn't pick the hard times in my life, but reflecting on them now, I realize I wouldn't be where I, I wouldn't believe the things I can believe about God. I, I guess the song comes to mind, uh, Through It All, by Andre Crouch. Through It All. If I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that he could solve it. I wouldn't know what faith in God could do. And so God sends trials our way so that we learn to depend upon him. How is character built? It's through the furnace of, of trials and temptations of life. God in his wisdom wants to make something out of us. Maybe he's teaching us patience right now. I can remember Mary Babcock here. Pastor, I want you to pray for me, for patience. Uh, oh, all right, I'll pray for you, Mary, to have patience, but indirectly you're praying for trials because <laughs> it's going to be waiting. It's going to be trials that test us. And sometimes it's to humble us of our pride. And if you're uh, obviously as a child of God, sometimes he has to discipline us because he's a good father. As a good father disciplines his children, so God does to us. And ought to be all, you know, to draw us close to him. But all of it is meant for our good. Did you know that? That's the encouraging part. Let me, because of these tri uh, trials, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, 
who comforts us in our affliction, so that, look at those words there, underline those. <laughs> so that, why? Why does God come? So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comforts with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Somebody who's lost a child or had a miscarriage uh, is able to carry and to help somebody else as well. God has comforted you through a trial and helped you. Now you can help somebody else with the same comfort that God has comforted you. And so that's part of the reason some of these trials come too. Uh, we are comforted by God and so that we can turn around and comfort others. And then Joseph in Genesis 50, 20 says this, as for you, looking at his brothers who had sold him into slavery, he says, as for you, you meant it for evil. There's no, anybody have any doubts about that? <laughs> Joseph looked at his brother, he said, man, you meant it for evil. When you sold me, man, that was the only intent you had. You wanted to do me harm. You hated my guts. You in, meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. To bring about uh, that many people should be kept alive as they are today, fulfilled. Boom, look at it from heaven's perspective. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You know, whatever somebody did to you, whatever somebody has done to you, it could be a spouse, it could be a friend or your best friend, and now you're at odds. Whatever the situation is, they meant it. And maybe rightly so, they meant it for evil. There was no good intention in how they said it to you or what they did to you. But can you then look at it and say, with Joseph today, but God meant it for good? And he has his purposes in it. We all know Romans 8, 28, pretty much by heart, don't we? <laughs> it starts out this way. And Paul, the Apostle Paul says, and we know. He doesn't say, and I hope. And I think. And I really hope so. But he says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Huh? All things work together for good to those who love God. The good and the bad. And one thing I remember Bill Ryan saying, uh, it stuck with me all these years is this. He said, God can do me no wrong. In the midst of some of the things he had to go through in life, and his trials that he was going through, even in the midst of it, he would just come up with this saying, God can do me no wrong. God can't do me any wrong. It's a pretty good perspective of God, isn't it? Remember, he's our father, too. So anything we're going through that we may not like it, but it's for our good. We can, if we see it as coming from his hand, though they meant it for evil, God, you meant it for good. Even if we don't know the outcome yet, and you may never know, can you at least say that God meant it for good? There's something coming out of it that could have come out no other way. He can use sickness, accidents, injuries, loss of jobs, or anything for his purposes. That's why I think my sister, after she was in that head-on collision in Germany, and as a result is in a wheelchair today, but joyful. And her husband testifies that after all these years, she's never complained once. How does that happen? Well, I think she just relies on this, that God meant it for good. They've shared the gospel with people they had never met before. They've had a lot of ministries that they could have no other way, relying on God. If, if we believe this, then we can do as James 1 says, right? Count it all joy, my brothers, <laughs> when you encounter various trials. What? Say again? That doesn't make any sense. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, patience. 
It produces something. That could come no other way. It's a trial of your faith. So if you know that, if you know that God is meant, he's teaching you something, he's going he's gonna to give you endurance. He's going to teach you patience. And that's, hold on to that. God, you're using this circumstance in my life to build endurance in me. And you can look at that situation and count it a joy then. Wow, God's working in me. <laughs> it's not like, don't look at it as God's taking his hand on. Look, God, you've got your hand on me. You're trying to produce some fruit in me that can't pr be produced any other way. So Lord, I'll put it in the column of joy. He's talking about that ledger like an accountant. You got the profit and loss. He said, put it in the profit position. Count it. Count it all joy. Let's put it on that call. Why? Because the testing of your faith meant to produce endurance. But you know the problem happens is where unbelief comes in. And in the midst of those certain sins, instead of benefiting by a trial, what? We produce bitterness, resentment. Woe is me. Maybe hatred. Maybe other things. What God meant for good, because we don't believe him in his word and we're not trusting him in this, we get better. And we're producing the fruit God never intended us to produce. And so it says, count it joy when you, brothers, when you count, and believing that what God said is true, hanging on to it, trusting him through it. Paul writes to the Philippians, says, and I want you to know, brothers, that he's in prison now. And he's writing to the Philippians. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, being in prison, what has happened to me has actually turned out to the furtherance of the gospel. Wow. He says, I just want you guys to know that. I'm in prison. No, I can't stand in the synagogues and preach. No, I can't stand in the street corners and preach, but the word of God isn't bound. I just want you to know that because of my imprisonment, other people who don't agree with me, they're out preaching the gospel. Praise God, he said. I'm sitting in your prison, but it's turned out to the furtherance of the gospel. And he was excited about it. Why? He again looked at that, his situation as God having his hand in it. You know, I was reading through uh, his arrest yesterday. And uh, Festus, was it Festus, brings Fe uh, Paul before trial. Felix had left Paul in prison for two years. Two years he left him in prison, thinking to do the Jews a favor. Paul sitting in prison. And then uh, Festus doesn't know what to do with him. King Agrippa comes to his area in Caesarea, and he says, uh, you know, hey, I, in our conversation, I was just reminded there's a, there's a prisoner here. There's been a prisoner left in, in prison by Felix. I don't know what to do with him. He says that his people want to kill him. They condemned him already to death by their own laws. Uh, I don't know what to do with him. He appealed to Caesar, and so he's going to Caesar, but I don't know what his charges are. Can you help me out? But I like the way he just said, he said, there's, there's a prisoner here, left in prison by, or a prisoner uh, left by Felix. And I thought of that. You know how Paul introduced himself? Who, who is this man that was left a prisoner? The Apostle Paul. Uh, Agrippa, that was the first time maybe he'd heard of him, and he's trying to get, figure things out, but he was God's man. That man in prison that they were talking about was God's man. Writing letters, writing letters from prison. Doing great things. He wasn't just a man, he was God's man. And so much so that we would be discouraged while he's in prison. Bummer. Man, who wants to go to prison? Paul says, when he writes the letter to the Ephesians, he said, Paul, a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. See how he looked at things? I'm not a prisoner of Rome. They think they got me. I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus. See how he turned every circumstance he was in? I'm in the prison. Praise God. The gospel went further. You see these? And I'm learning these things because I'm so prone when I go through things to complain. I'm, you know, if you know me, you know that. <laughs> But if we can look at it from heaven's perspective, that God is all wise, not only with his dealings with Apostle Paul, not only with his dealings with uh, Jacob and, and Abraham and, and Joseph, but he's actually wise in his dealings with Dan Breckner too. After all, he knows me through and through, better than I know myself. And God is wise in his dealings with each one of you too. The Apostle Paul, 
uh, was enabled to say about his thorn in the flesh. Remember that? Whatever that was. I just see thorn and flesh, and that sounds painful to me. I don't need to be explained anymore, okay? It hurts, whatever. But anyway, it came to him that he, he saw this thing, this thorn in the flesh, as a messenger for Satan, from Satan to harass him. What was the source of it? It's a messenger from Satan to harass me. Tempting Paul to think bad thoughts maybe about this God he serves. But he resisted that temptation and he sought God three times. God, this thorn that I have in the flesh, would you please remove it? God, remove it. And the, only, the answer he got was this. Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. That was God's answer. And as he began to reflect upon his situation, he realized that the reason why he was afflicted with this was to keep him humble. And he said, to keep me from being coming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. God had revealed so many things to Paul. And he could be prone then to be conceited and lifted up. Oh, God has used me mightily. Oh, I'm a man of God. Everybody looks to me. And God said, no. Nah. And Paul, after thinking about it, said, man, God is wise. Even this thorn in the flesh, he said, my grace. You know, I could take it from you, Paul. But you need this in your life. You need this. Listen, but my grace is sufficient for you. My grace will help you. It'll get you through. I don't know if you've ever gone through things like that. You get through the end and you realize the only way I got through that was the grace of God. Because there were times where it felt like God wasn't there. It got me through the grace of God. So grace of God to get us to endure the thing. If he doesn't remove it, he'll give us a grace to go through it, right? He can. I've seen God heal like that on the spot. Many times I prayed, he doesn't do anything. But either way, I come, he's able. But if he doesn't, his grace will be sufficient. And so Paul recognized that two things. God said, no, my grace is sufficient. So he thought about that. He thought, oh, this came to keep me humble. This came. There's a reason God did this. And I see it now. He keeps me humble. And so his final conclusion to the whole, his attitude now was, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness so that the power of Christ may, come, may rest upon me. That was his new attitude. I'm going to go forward. I'm going to boast in my weakness. Hmm. And I think his attitude, isn't it a model for us here this morning? The model, that same attitude. He accepted this thorn as wisely appointed by God and found a reason to rejoice in it. And he'll give us grace in our troubles, won't he? God's able to remove it, but he also gives grace to go through it. God's wise in his timing with everything. How about the, the place where you were, the timing of your birth? Do you realize God was wise in that, putting you in the family and giving you kids, the parents you have, that God in his wisdom gave you just the right parents. He made you born where the place where you were born for the perfect time in history. You're not here by accident. God's timing is perfect. And every trial in your life is under the wisdom, is under God's wisdom. Sometimes it's to humble us. He'll prune us. He'll deepen our faith, nurture us, take care of us through it, but also mature us spiritually to conform us more and more into the image of Jesus, to be more Christ-like. That's his goal. And even though Satan and his demons use evil, God can turn it for a good purpose, can he? Just like Job. I think a verse to help us through, we maybe know it by heart, but Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. We got it in our 
as you enter our house, that verse is right in front there. The next verse, the next part says, and do not lean on your own understanding. And I remember a friend of mine coming, sitting down there, looking at that, reading that passage, he says, well, I lean on my understanding. He kind of looked at me like, who are you, bozo? I mean, who doesn't lean on their own understanding? <laughs> Well, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean on your not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your path. He will direct your paths. Huh? Here it is. Trust Him through it, and not in any way to, to lift up Denise. But Denise has shown, I think, a good example of this of the cancer and going through it, but with joy. Paul said this. Paul says, "Suffering, uh, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing." There is sorrow in this. There is tears over cancer. There's so Paul says, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, not having much, yet many making many rich. And he found he found good and saw everything. And I think uh, Denise's example has been an example of that to, to me. It's shown bright, and I think to many of us who know Denise and are there for prayer meeting, the joy on her, despite what she's going through. This shows it's real, isn't it? This stuff we're talking about in here is not, uh, you know, pie, pie, a dream. This is reality. And if we could learn to trust as she does and as, as, as God would have us. So what do we do in that same passage he's talking about, count it all joy. Ask for wisdom. Ask for wisdom. I, I think if I have a prayer that I ask more often than any other, it's that. To be honest with you, because I'm, I guess I'm a dummy, and I really don't know. And so I find myself, God, give me wisdom, because I certainly don't know what to do right now in this. And James gets down there, he says, uh, uh, let me, before I read it, he says, let me just ask you, do you have any important decisions that need to be made? Do you need wisdom? I, I just say go to the source of wisdom, all wisdom. Go to God. Don't go to books. <laughs> Don't start there. Don't go to a book on that, a self-help book, even a priest or a pastor. First, go to God. God. What's he say? If any man lacks wisdom, ask Pastor Dan, because he's got it. You know, you know, you already know I'm not very smart, so <laughs> you already know that. But go to God. Go to the source. Start there. Nothing wrong with ants and counsel, but, but start there. Always start there with God. We might use others to confirm it, the word of the Lord. Encourage in that. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Okay, let's do that then. Who gives generously to all. A-L-L. -L. Don't you like that? Oh, yeah, but he gives wisdom to everybody but me. Is that what it says here? If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously. Generously. God gives like that. You know, I don't. I don't, be honest with you. Somebody calls up the church and says, hey, I need money for this. I'm having a hard time. I just can't make the bills, pay the bills. Could you pay my my television bill? No, I, I have had that too, but... Uh, I won't pay for your television, but I'll pay for your food and stuff. And I buy generously for them. And then they come back a day later. Well, yeah, we, we need money for this again. You know, I, my attitude often is I'm stingy. Didn't I just give you something yes, last week or this week? You want more money today? Aren't you glad God's not like that when you really need? I mean, okay, I'll admit I'm, I'm shafted a lot of times too, okay? So I, I got to be careful. But God in his wisdom, he, he says, you need wisdom. I'll give it to you. I'm a generous. Yeah, I know you asked this morning. And you need it again this afternoon. I'm generous. I'll give it. I'll give it to you. He's generous. To all, again, put your name in there if you have to. He's generous to Dan. He's generous to Bob. He's generous to Emil there. And all of you guys, he's generous. Ask. And he won't reproach you. He won't say, have that any reproach for asking. 
and it will be given to him. Ask and it will be given to you. That keeps you on your knees, doesn't it? <laughs> it will be given. Then you go, I want you to finish reading it for your own benefit. Those next few verses are very important. Ask in faith, not doubting. But anyway, do that on your own. And so we look at day-to-day uh, -day experiences that we go through. Let's look at them from a heavenly perspective and be encouraged to trust God who is all wise. The Bible tells us walk in wisdom towards them or are outside. Walk in wisdom. We need God's wisdom. Do you want to make wise choices in your life? I think most of us want to make wise choices choices. Here's a little hint, though, that'll help you sometimes if you think of this. In making a decision, what will most give God the most glory? If I make this decision, I have two options before me. Which decision is going to give God the greatest honor, the greatest glory? What's going to magnify Him the greatest? If that's helpful in those decision-making, then to God be the glory, but ask him. So let me just sum it all up. God is all wise. He's established the world by wisdom. He's a wise in the plan of salvation. God is wise in his dealings with you. And if you ask for wisdom, he'll give it. And I just finished with Paul's words to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Father in heaven, you are not all, only all-powerful, all-knowing. Oh, Lord, help us to get to realize, not just in our heads that you are all-wise, but that you are all-wise in your dealings with me. That if you know the number of hairs on our heads and that if we're more value, more, have more value than the animals or than the birds do, that you actually take a concern with my life and with the life of every person in this room, that you actually take an interest. And we think back to David's words, it says, Lord, when I sit, you know when I sit down, when I stand up, you know every little single little thing about me. Why wouldn't you care about me? You do. And so I pray that, Lord, we would see your wisdom in the trials that we go through and realize that it's a testing of our faith that is able to produce things in us that could come no other way. And so as we face things, God, we look to you for wisdom, for help. Even in the bad circumstances of our life, help us like Paul, sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Help us to look at it from heaven's perspective. That only a wise God would allow certain things and get us through it and give us the grace to go through it when we need to. Or in your own wisdom, sometimes you just remove it. But whatever it is, Lord, may we be found a people that are trusting in you, not leaning on our own understanding, for your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are much higher than ours. Help us to rely on you this week. And as times come, Lord, we, we, just, we just trust you. And thank you, Lord, for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be closed with a song here and be dismissed. If anybody wants to come for prayer, please feel free to come up and pray.